I read a good joke. If you think that you have done little to stop the war, remember the UN and it will become easier for you. You are watching the Ukraine on Fire project. My name is Rule. Let's start. It's nice to be a prophet. Exactly on April 7, Peskov, in an interview with Sky News, admitted as if nothing had happened that Russian troops had suffered significant losses in Ukraine. And this is a big tragedy. How many troops yes, have we lost? We have, we have, we have significant losses of troops and uh, it's, it's, it's a huge tragedy for us. This is a great tragedy, but according to him, marauders and war criminals died in order to stop the Third World War. Thus, even without nuclear weapons, Ukraine entered the club of states that are capable of starting a Third World War simply by defending themselves from an attack on Irpin and Bucha. And while Peskov was shedding tears on TV, a fresh alley of 55 paratroopers of the elite regiment of the airborne forces appeared in Russia. In these photographs you see servicemen of the 247th Guards Airborne Assault Caucasian Karsak Regiment. I don't know why they don't have whips, but in Ukraine the detachment was dismantled for parts on the very first day. By the way, this is important for the Dagestan Book of Records. Nurmagom Gadzimagondovom lived only a day in this war, but became the first hero of Russia in this special operation. The hero of a shameful and inglorious war, in which he died not for Dagestan, not for his family, but really for nothing. This is just what Vladimir Putin wanted. The Russian president will send clean packages to Nurmagom's colleagues so that the bodies are not confused with the heads and that there are an even number of them. You know, I have lived in Ukraine for many decades and have always believed that our country has great potential. But I never thought that we were so powerful. Nuclear bomb, almost. Biological weapons, any. Bomb the Donbass so that it stands like new for eight years, no problem. To oppress the Russians from Lisbon to Vladivostok is also our job. At the same time, reporting on our large-scale villainous plans on TV in the kitchen, from the second TV in the bedroom, Russian propaganda broadcast about drug addicts in the government of Ukraine, that degenerates serve in the Ukrainian army, and that the country is ruled by the Nazis. But looking at the second month of the war, I am grateful to God that drug addicts rule us, and not experienced business executives and strategists from Russia. While our drug addicts were harmlessly consuming, Russian business executives were stealing. They robbed not only the people, but also their own army. And then the Russian army in tatters on rusty Soviet buckets was thrown under Bayraktar, Javelin and NLAW. Conscripts, defenseless bunnies from the airborne forces, guardsmen of the Emir of Chechnya Kadyrov in bulletproof vests made of reinforced sheepskin. And do not forget about the pilots who were trained to bomb Syrian cities unprotected by air defense. I have a question for Russian Minister of Defense Shugu. Knowing this state of the army, you should have been the dove of peace. The man who was supposed to kneel before Putin and beg not to attack Ukraine. Because colossal theft and bluff will be revealed. Tens of thousands of marauders and war criminals will die. And NATO, along with Japan and China, will watch in dumb amazement as buffoonery turns into agony in the performance of the second army of the world. But there are even more questions for the director of the Russian Foreign Intelligence Service, Nerishin. What do you mean, otherwise you propose to start negotiations? No, I, uh, yes, I support the proposal to join the Donetsk and Lugansk People's Republics into the Russian Federation. We don't talk about it, we don't discuss it. We are talking about recognizing their independence. Yes, I support the proposal to recognize independence. After such a shameful bleating in front of Putin and an absolutely inadequate assessment of the Ukrainian authorities, the army and the people, you should not write articles about NATO dragging Russia into the Afghan scenario. Are you sure that NATO is to blame? After all, Biden begged you for two months not to attack Ukraine. Macron at this time called Putin almost every day. Scholz implored you in the name of Angela Merkel not to touch Ukraine. Only Verka Serdyachka didn't call you, and that was because she was busy all the time. 
And now Peskov says that you feel sorry for the dead Russians. Obviously he's lying. He himself is afraid of losing his job and really wants to return his daughter to Paris. The daughter is furious and yells at her dad, it all becomes unbearable. But most importantly, Mr. Nerishin, why did you attack Ukraine at all? The Russian people are completely confused. Are you trying to tell me that Russia attacked Ukraine because we say glory to Ukraine to each other? Okay, people are confused. But Maria Zakharova, director of the information and press department at the Russian Foreign Ministry, must know exactly why dozens of Ukrainian cities were destroyed, tens of thousands of Ukrainians died, and millions became refugees. Cookery books were also banned. Why? Because it was impossible to share borscht. Borscht had to belong to someone alone. One people. One nationality. But what if borscht belongs to everyone, so that in each region the hostess can cook it in her own way? No way. They didn't want to compromise. This is xenophobia, Nazism, extremism in all forms. We will not give you the recipe for borscht, it is like a ballad about heather honey. For I doubt the sapling courage that goes without the beard. But now in vain is the torture, fire shall never avail, here dies in my bosom the secret of heather ale. A long time ago, Robert Louis Stevenson pointed out to Zakharova that there would be no borscht with sour cream and it was time for her to sail in the wake of a Russian ship. Yesterday, our employee wrote in a general chat, I don't want to be a reason for sanctions, I want to be among those whom they will help. Yesterday Russia launched a missile attack on the railway station in Kramatorsk. Fifty people died on the spot, five of them children. Another hundred people were taken to the hospital. At first, the Russians wrote that the strike was aimed at a cluster of Ukrainian fighters. Then, that it was Ukraine itself that killed its citizens. Since the first war in Donbass and the crash of the Malaysian Boeing, the strategy of Russian propagandists has not changed, but the number of war crimes requiring at least some justification is growing. After the Ukrainian army liberated the village of Makarov near Kiev, a mass grave was discovered. According to preliminary data, 132 local residents were killed. So should we believe that sanctions will help stop death and destruction? Yes, but you need to understand that victories at the front are more important than sanctions. We cannot defeat Russia militarily, but our successes at the front not only save civilian lives, but also create a confident negotiating position. The better things are at the front, the easier it is to explain to Putin that it is easier and cheaper for him to build the scenery of Kiev somewhere in Russia and hold a sham victory parade there. And believe me, his propaganda is capable of such a trick, because nothing is impossible for it. For example, Russian propagandists are now accusing the Western press of a crime because the Western press is covering the massacre in Bucha. And I'm not kidding. By spreading fakes and blocking the truth, alternative point of view, materials of investigators and direct speech, they are accomplices in this terrible tragedy, which was the result of the crime of the Kiev regime. And if this did not happen at the command of the Kiev regime, then there are forces that have already got out of Zelensky's control, or have never obeyed him at all. I accuse the Western media, and above all the American ones, of not just spreading fakes and disinformation, but of complicity in the crime in the city of Butcher. Your newspapers, your television, your columnists are complicit in this punitive action. The sanctions work, but Russia is too big and too poor for everyone, everywhere and at the same time to feel it. Yes, the oligarchs and the middle class immediately felt the burn, but they still sincerely believe that now Putin will come to his senses and sign a peace treaty. Or he will not come to his senses and seize the whole of Ukraine, and then sign a peace treaty, but with NATO. 
The oligarchs and the middle class will be happy with any solution. They don't give a damn about anything but the usual way of life. And so that you can come back to Tuscany or sail on a yacht in Monaco. It turned out that neither the oligarchs nor the middle class can influence Putin in any way. The former are severely pressed by the FSB, the latter are pissed off at the word, Ramzan, or, prosecutor's office. It is still more difficult with the chipmunk people, and before the invasion of Ukraine, we had no idea how much. It suddenly turned out that asphalt in the village and washing machines in houses are some kind of unprecedented luxury for them. For a soldier from the Russian hinterland, here's another great story. The governor of the Kursk region said that it was time to add dye or hydrogen hydrogen sulfide to process water for centralized heating systems. Because the chipmunk nation drains water from heating systems everywhere. At first I did not understand why, but it turned out that this is a real problem for many regions of Russia. People use process water to bathe, wash dishes, and cook food for livestock, and maybe even for themselves. After all, technical water is not much different from drinking water. How? How can we crush with sanctions the people who wash themselves with water from the radiator? However, the sanctions are working. The masters of Russia are the officials and the repressive apparatus. Police, intelligence agencies, prosecutors, courts. They are the main goal of the sanctions and the main danger to the absolute power of Vladimir Putin. In the coming months, less money will flow into Russia. America and the EU are effectively closed for travel. The oligarchs are getting poorer, the middle class is starting to worry about mortgage payments. You can, of course, try to take technical water from the heating radiators from the chipmunk people. But this will still not be enough. Here comes a very disturbing moment for Putin, his trough is running out of food for his faithful pigs. And the food for his pigs is the main thing. And preferably in the same quantities. And no calls to reduce portions for the sake of greatness and victory will affect them. Because the pigs are loyal to the full trough, and not personally to Vladimir Putin. He is for them only a function that is responsible for the uninterrupted supply of the nutrient substance. Putin is temporary, but the trough, I mean, great Russia is eternal. If there is no trough, then the pigs are ready to unleash an atomic war. They talk about it from every iron, every day. It is quite casual and even with enthusiasm in the eyes and ridiculous smirks. The main task of the West is to convince the pigs that Putin's departure does not mean the end of feeding. On the contrary, this is the only solution that can save the feeder. An equally important question is whether the world is ready for the collapse of Russia and the emergence of ten independent nuclear states, one of which will be headed, for example, by Kadyrov, and the second by Gherkin. For Ukraine, the collapse of Russia is a national idea. Now it remains for us to understand how our dreams coincide with the strategy of the West. I think that our interests coincide here. But we will talk about this in our next issues. From good news, a lot of powerful, long-range air defense came to us. And the United States remembered Lend-Lease, the state program that helped the USSR and its allies defeat Nazi Germany. But more on that in the next issue. You watched the project Ukraine on fire, the Russian Federation will lose. Glory to Ukraine. And now I will show you where the attack on Belarus was being prepared from. And if six hours before the operation there had not been a preventive strike on positions. Four positions. Four positions. I'll show you, I've brought the map. They would have attacked our troops of Belarus and Russia, who were in the exercises. Therefore, we did not unleash this war, our conscience is clear. Listen, please shut up. Let's sleep.